Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here this morning on this Lord's Day. Let's stand together, please. And we're going to start out with the screen singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Let's do this together as unto the Lord this wonderful Lord's Day. Holy, 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 Lord. in prayer, please. Amen. Okay, remember the wave now. Good to see everybody. Give that Christian wave. Good to see everybody. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. Draw your attention back to the screen this morning again as we sing this song together. Let's make this like a prayer this morning. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Precious Redeemer and a friend Who would have thought that a lamb could Rescue the souls of men Oh, you rescue the souls of men Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger. 
prayer this morning. Amen? Let's stand together. We continue to read through the book of Psalms together, and we're in Psalm chapter 18 this morning, verses 21 through 30. And as we read the word of God together, let's do this now. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his ordinances were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless with him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyes. With the kind you show yourself kind, with the blameless you show yourself blameless, with the pure you show yourself pure, and with the crooked you show yourself astute. For you saved an afflicted people, but haughty eyes you abase, for you light my lamp, the Lord my God illumines my darkness, for by you I can run upon a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is blameless, the word of the Lord is tried, he is a shield to all who take refuge in him. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Thank you, and you may be seated. Amen. Well, we're glad to see you this morning, and uh, it's good to be back with you. I want to thank uh, Brother Jeff Francoeur, get a hold of him, and offer my thanks to him also for uh, Brother Skip Denault and John Chase filling in for me while we were gone. My wife and I went to Nova. Anybody know what, where Nova is? I told you last time, Nova, that's N-O, Northern, V-A, another hint? Northern Virginia, that's where we were, Northern Virginia, and then we were down in uh, Washington, D.C. over the last several days, and yes, Washington, D.C., you can fly back and forth, you're good, and no, Northern Virginia, you can't do that, unless you come back to the state, and then you have to, what do they call it, the holy huddle? Oh, no, it's called quarantine. You have to quarantine up, right? So you may be saying, well, Pastor, when did you get back? We got back Thursday. Do the math. 14 days. Oh, didn't quite make it. But we did go get that test, and we are negative. Aren't you glad about that? Most, yeah, most people think I'm negative anyway. So, I mean, you know, I just fit right in the scheme of things. But it was nice to be down there with family and uh we, you go through Williamsburg, we enjoyed that. Uh, Great Wolf Lodge, we enjoyed that. Not a promo, but if you've never had the opportunity to be there, hey, that was a wonderful time too. 
And uh, so we're glad to be back, and again, grateful for those who filled in for us while we were away. Okay, let me make a few announcements here, but before I do, it's time to dismiss Junior Church off to the Fellowship Hall with Mrs. Sargent. She has just been itching to be back with her Junior Church, and there they go. Amen. All right, just a few announcements again. Just a reminder, for Mondays at 9.15 a.m., there is the American Sign Language ASL class, and they meet next door, White Building in the Red Room. Christian Ed Building, White Building, Red Room, and they do that Mondays at 9.15. If you have not already gone to the polls, I hear that there's an election going on. Tuesday is election day, right? So if you haven't gone and you wake up Wednesday morning, guess what? In our state, you might be too late. Other states, I don't know, you might not be too late. I'm not sure. They're they're working that a little differently this year. But um, just want to remind you, Tuesday's election day. Wednesday, we have our Bible study and prayer hour. Brother Skip filled in for us while we're away. We're going to be looking back into the book of Colossians again. Very interesting material there, what Paul has to share with the Church of Colossae, and it applies to our lives here today as well. Junior Travelers, grades 1 through 6, be meeting. 7 o'clock, Blast, which is our junior and senior high, they will also be meeting. And I do have an announcement to make about Blast for you parents that have teenagers in Blast. Every year at this time, they usually go to the Word Life Reverb in Providence, Rhode Island. And they have thousands of kids meet together in this place, all kinds of activities. Well, because of some of what we have going on this year, they're not going to be able to do that. They're not meeting. But our BLAST group wanted to have an event for our kids anyway. So what they're going to be hosting this coming Friday, if you have not already got word about this, this coming Friday, they are going to have an in-church all-nighter. Wow. And I, boy, they're looking forward to that being together. Now, let me tell you, wait, wait a minute, my radar goes up. Will they be safe? Yes. Will they still have to abide by the Yes. But they're looking forward to having an in-church all-nighter. Drop-off here is Friday, November the 6th. Pick-up is Saturday, November the 7th. And you can pick up between 9.30, 10 a.m. Because you remember the reverb? They'd go Friday, and then they'd go all night long, and then they'd come home on Saturday. So they're going to instead do a little all-nighter here, and they have a lot of things planned for the kids. Kids are looking forward to being together and taking a part of this. Dinner, breakfast. Their midnight snacks, everything's going to be provided for them. So we're looking forward to them having this event. And I do have something. It says, um, maybe you can help me with this, PJs are the recommended attire. Right? PJs are the recommended attire. So I wish I I could come down and see some of those PJs. I think they're going to be wild. Batman PJs, Mandalorian PJs, Star Wars PJs. Minnie Mouse PJs, all this kind of stuff, right? No, they're going to have a lot of fun, and so we look forward to them coming. They will be safe. Everything will be taken care of. Our leaders will make sure of that. But they just have this time. They want to do something for the kids because they're missing out on this reverb. And so if you allow them to come, that would be great. Thursday, 930, uh, Bible study here, the Gospel Project downstairs with our ladies uh, in person, in church. And then on Thursday nights, for those who can't make it, Thursday morning at 930, 630 Ladies Gospel Project. Uh, also, thanks to those ladies who, who filled in for Connie while she was away with this gospel project. Um, she appreciates that, and I know I do as well. Thanksgiving Baskets is a box right there. Uh, John should have mentioned to you, I guess it was last week, that we were starting our Thanksgiving Baskets. And because we have to do it a little bit different this year, we are just taking financial contributions, and we're going to make sure we have... Uh, those contributions together, we're going to make sure to be able to get those out and help people who are in need of a little bit extra. As God has blessed us, we want to be a blessing to others. Amen. Amen. And just because COVID's going on and pandemic and all this kind of stuff that's happening doesn't mean we have to stop being a church or stop being a blessing to others. And so we want to do that. You've always been more than generous. And we ask that you continue to do that by way of this box. And we can still still help people out during that time. All right. I believe that's all the announcements that I have. So what we're going to do in front of you, you should have um, communion cups there, and you can get that ready for yourself. And as you're getting ready, let me just pray. We're going to read the scripture. We'll pray first, get right into the scripture, and, and then we'll observe the Lord's table together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
We thank you for this opportunity that we have to be here today. And Father, I ask and pray that you would um, meet with us this morning in these next few moments. God, as we observe your table, that you would help us to remember your broken body, your shed blood for us. And as a result of what you have done for us, you've given everything, even your life. May we recognize that everything we are and everything we have and everything we ever hope to be is because of you. And so, Father, even this morning as we meet here in our service, as we participate in the giving of our tithes and offerings and mission support, we just give back to you a portion of what's already yours out of obedient hearts. We're thankful for this church ministry, for the faithfulness of the people here who come and who give in support, not only, not only their tithes, offerings, and mission support, but their prayer support, and their ministry support, and their serving in Jesus' name. So bless us, we pray. Amen. Reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. When he gave thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, for this is my body. This is broken for you. Tom, would you pray, please? They took the bread and they did eat. In the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Bernie, would you pray, please? They took the cup and made it so. This morning, please, and we're going to turn not to Peter this time this morning, but we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 
1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I want to share a few thoughts with you this morning, a little bit different. We're going to take a step back just for this morning from the book of 1 Peter as we have been going through that book and still continue to be going through that book, looking forward to it every time we open the Word of God to study in the 1 Peter, and then we'll be moving from 1 Peter into the book of 2 Peter. Again, looking forward to that. But this morning, we're going to start by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians and chapter number 1. Verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you perfectly be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And then he says in verse number 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It's interesting in the first 10 verses that we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, did you notice the first 10 verses 10 times the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned? You think Paul's trying to emphasize something to us? It really is all about the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? Yeah. Our verse that we want to springboard off this morning is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for he says, for the message or the preaching or the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is, it is the power of God. Now, just before we begin, I usually keep my phone with me so I can log my time, but while I'm standing up here, I just received a message and I want to just take time and pray right now. Sandy Baker, who attends our church, member of our church, just messaged me that her sister passed this morning uh, in a motor vehicle accident. Please keep us in your prayers, she writes. Especially her daughter Jennifer. It happened in Ossipee, New Hampshire. So... Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are our God. We thank you that Jesus is our Savior. We thank you that being saved and knowing the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal relationship, we have abiding in us the Holy Spirit of the living God. And Father, while we are at a loss for words, we think about the sudden tragedy of a loved one like this. We know that there's nothing that escapes your eye or your tender care for all those who are in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray for Sandy's family. 
Jennifer, God, that you would touch her heart and that you administer to her as only you can. I pray for Sandy that you would envelop her in your grace and your care and your love at this time. Father, we're reminded as we read the Bible of the times that our Lord Jesus Christ wept over the loss of friends, family alike. In fact, one brief verse in the Gospel of John reminds us that Jesus wept the loss of a very dear friend named Lazarus, whom he would later resurrect back to life. God, be with the family. Please watch over them and meet their every need. And we thank you for what you're going to do. And we bring to you our prayer with thanksgiving, knowing that you are almighty God and that you will work on their behalf. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross, the word of the cross, the Bible says, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Do you see that today? You see that where you live today? The people you deal with today? Perhaps starting in your own home with certain family members, you're burdened for them, you pray for them. You weep out to God, God touch their heart, God save them, but to them, that word, that message of the cross is foolishness to them. But the Bible says something to us that's very, very important. And that is, it says, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Some events in human history impact us greatly. We'll forever remember them, where we were when they occurred. Now, I was not even born at this time, but I think of some events like Pearl Harbor. Those from our congregation who went in to serve during the war. I think of events, I was just a young child when this occurred, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Troops coming home from Vietnam. And the reception they received. The assassination attempt on President Ronald Reagan. The start of Operation Desert Storm. The 911 September 11th attacks on the towers in New York City. I think all of us at different points in time we can remember, I can take you back to some of these events, and I can remember as clear as crystal where I was when some of these huge events in the modern era, in my lifetime, in your lifetime, took place. And how I considered them, and the impact they had on me. But today, what I want to do is I want to remember and reflect and recognize the most selfless, sacrificial act that has impacted so many people everywhere, the world over, that it's become the most important moment in history to every life that's been touched by it. And when we claim it as our own, it not only ignites hope in us as individuals, but a hope collectively in our nation. Our nation today is in need of hope. Can I say, hear amen? amen? We're broken. We're divided. We're hurting. We're masked. We're separated. I was so overjoyed last night when my daughter in Indiana, in her little town, an interesting name for her town too, Battleground, right? Battleground, Indiana. But when she's sitting on her front porch with her little ears on and she says, oh, just wanted to FaceTime, let you know what we're doing. And she got the big porch and two ghosts hanging down from there and her kids are out on the sidewalk with a big basket of candy everybody walking through giving out their candy 
And I says, oh, you, what are you doing? She says, well, it's trick or treat. It's Halloween. And I said, and you, you get to do this? And she said, yes, in our town, in our community, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., everybody gets to go out and trick or treat. She said, Dad, this is the first time that things kind of felt normal. There, there's like this, the, my thinking is, is like a normalcy. Oh, they were being careful and they were spacing and all this kind of stuff. But it was just interesting while she's sitting there talking to us and hearing Happy Halloween and us looking at the kids in their costumes and reaching in the basket or letting people, you know, get their candies and stuff like this and, and just... wonderful that there's just some little bit of something that we can say wow it was a little normal there my heart was joyed for them I thought of hope hope and the hope that you and I can have today as we seek to live for Jesus Christ and the hope there is for America today when we seek to live for Jesus Christ. So I want to remember, I want to reflect, I want to recognize the most selfless sacrificial act. But before we do that, I want to first of all remember that we are a nation with a legacy. Do you realize that? We are a nation with a legacy. This is a nation that has a godly heritage. This is a nation that was founded on God's word and its precepts and its principles. And unfortunately, over the last so many years, this just didn't happen today. This has been a process of years where some have attempted to revise our history to, I believe, to seek to undermine the character and the integrity of our founding fathers saying that they weren't who we believe them to be. There are those who say that our founders were not motivated by principle, but property. There are those today who say that they came seeking fortune instead of faith and the opportunity to worship God. And while that may have been the motive for some, it certainly wasn't the motive of the majority. The men who signed the Declaration of Independence had far more to lose than to gain. Have you ever thought about that? I was just down in Williamsburg, and again, you know, they have the copies, and, and it just, it's colonial, you know, everything's colonial, period, right? We, we, I, I, I guess, guess who I got to meet? I got to meet Patrick Henry. Right? I mean, that was cool. Right? And, and he was on the stage and he spoke in the vernacular of the day and in the costume of the day. And, and the fellow that did this, this actor, I mean, it was, it was fantastic. It took me right back to, remember Patrick Henry's work, famous words, give me liberty or give me death. Right? I saw copies of the Declaration of Independence and I began to think of each man, each individual that signed their name to that document. And then I fast forwarded to where we live today and I thought to myself, how many men of that character and that faith in God, how many men would sign their lives to a document like that today? There were lawyers and other professionals in their field. There were landovers, successful farmers. There were merchants. They were shopkeepers. Others were physicians. Some were ministers. Others were statesmen. They were in educated. They were educated individuals, good standing in their communities. They knew prosperity. But interestingly enough, there was something more important to them than all that combined, and it's found in one word, freedom. Call it liberty. But that meant more to them than anything else. Interestingly enough, they knew that the penalty for treason was death by hanging, and yet, and yet, they signed those documents anyway. 
Two of these individuals, among the many who signed the Declaration of Independence before God and fellow man, stated one of them is from this area here. You remember in the Boston, New England area, John Hancock, as he signed his name. And by the way, if you've ever seen a copy of the Declaration of Independence, his, his signature is like, what, this big or something? You know, I mean, he just... And it's stated that as he signed, he signed his name large, and he said, quote, now his majesty can read my name without his spectacles. There was another individual by the name of Stephen Hopkins. He was a very old man at the time. And as he took that quill pen and began to sign, his hand shook as he signed. And he looked up at all the other individuals there waiting to sign. And he said, gentlemen, my hand trembles, but my heart does not. Others in the nation's history recognized a dependence. Not a dependence striving for freedom alone or liberty alone, but a dependence on God that would bring that about, that would make it possible for a young and fledgling nation. Our first president, George Washington, took the oath of office and put his hand on what? The Bible. That was not a prop. That was a heartfelt belief request to place the hand on the Bible in every president's sense at a swearing in. Congress determined to open every session of Congress with prayer. And who would lead in these prayers? They would call upon chaplains. We will not hold the session of Congress until prayer is made to Almighty God giving us wisdom, guidance, and direction. In 1776, 11 of the 13 colonies required that one had to be a Christian to be eligible to run for political office. Well, what would that do if that was still in play today? In 1777, the Continental Congress voted to spend $300,000. Now, 1777, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money now. In 1777, the Continental Congress voted to spend $300,000 to purchase Bibles for distribution to be given out throughout the young, new nation. In his Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address, you remember this, President Abraham Lincoln, 16th President of these United States, stated, this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. 94% of the writings of the Founding Fathers contain quotations from what? The Word of God. If you've never been to Washington, D.C., go down there. Go down there. Check out the monuments. Check out the scripture all over the city. The state constitutions of all 50 states... Mention who? God. The Liberty Bell has part of Leviticus 25.10 inscribed on its exterior, which says this, quote, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. An image of Moses carrying the tablets of God's law faces the Speaker of the House of Representatives. You can't get away from the word of God in Washington unless you purposely turn away wherever you go. The Supreme Court itself begins each of its sessions with the phrase, God save the United States and this honorable court. The first vice president and second president, Jonathan Adams, wrote, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. President John Adams. President Thomas Jefferson said, quote, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. What does that say to you about today? Our sixth president, John Quincy Adams, said, quote, No book in the world deserves to be so unceasingly studied and so profoundly meditated upon as the Bible. 
Theodore Roosevelt, America's 26th president, wrote, quote, in this actual world, a churchless community, a community where men have abandoned and scoffed at or ignored their religious deeds, is a community on the rapid downgrade. Woodrow Wilson, our 28th president and governor of New Jersey, said, quote, America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of the Holy Scripture. Calvin Coolidge, our 30th president, said this about our founding fathers. He said of them, they were intent upon establishing a Christian commonwealth in accordance with the principle of self-government. They were an inspired body of men. It has been said that God sifted the nations that he might send choice grain into the wilderness. Who can fail to see it in the hand of destiny? Who can doubt that it has been guided by a divine providence? Folks, we're talking about our nation. Franklin Roosevelt prayed this prayer on a radio, national radio broadcast on D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, as our troops stormed the beaches of Normandy, France. He said this, quote, Almighty God, with thy blessing we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogance. Lead us to the saving of our country. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Amen. Harry Truman, our 33rd president, understood the spiritual heritage of this nation when he said, if men and nations would but live by the precepts of the ancient prophets and the teachings of the Sermon of the Mount, problems which now seem so difficult would soon disappear. Let me give you a couple more. Gerald Ford, our 38th president, actually quoted a 1955 speech by Dwight D. Eisenhower on December the 5th, 1974, quoting his speech, he said, quote, without God, there could be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Thus, the founding fathers of America sought, and thus, with God's help, it will continue to be. President Ronald Reagan said, quote, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be one nation gone under. And then, lastly, Benjamin Franklin, when challenged about having a political session opened with prayer, he said this, quote, I've lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire can rise without his aid. We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Now, regardless, regardless of what some may think, when the rights and liberties we enjoy as a nation, when they cease to be wrapped in biblical principles, this nation and her citizens will become a mockery. We see that from the beginning, the early writings of our founding fathers, all the way up to the current day. So let's take a moment and reflect. Let's take a moment and reflect. What started out as a normal day suddenly changed. I'm going to take you back. The date was September 11, 2001. And at 8.46 in the morning, an American Airlines flight slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York. And that flight, that experience, would set in motion a chain of attacks upon this nation. And in a matter of 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 2,996 individuals who were husbands, they were wives, they were parents, or they were children, lost their lives. 
Now that normal day became a day of sorrow. That normal day became a day of sadness and fear. That normal day became a day of regret, remorse, and anger. That normal day became a time of hurt. A day that we moved from passiveness to prayer as a result of what happened in that 90-minute period. It became a day again we're a united nation you know isn't it interesting on that day do you remember how quickly flags came and they flew at half staff can you remember how quickly it seemed like everybody was hanging a flag outside their house everybody was attaching a flag to their car and driving around even members of congress I call to your memory some people said it was just a photo op. I'd like to think it was more. But even members of Congress gathered on the Capitol steps and together they joined hands and sang, God bless America. Right. Baseball games during the seventh inning stretch. What were they doing? They were singing, God bless America. It was a dark day. Churches around the nation were praying. Churches and Christians, individual believers were seeking reassurance. They were looking for answers. They were looking for assurance and comfort from God, seeking for hope in what seemed to be a very dark and hopeless time. And that brings us to the expectation for America. On September the 13th, there was a man named Frank Selakia who made his way through the smoldering ruins two days after the towers came down. He stopped and rubbed his eyes in disbelief, for in front of him stood a two-ton, 20-foot cross made of steel in the midst of that rubble. Silakia testified to reporters. He said, quote, when I first saw the cross, it took my heart and made me cry for about 20 minutes. It helped me healed the burden of my despair and gave me closure on the whole catastrophe. That cross became a powerful symbol of hope and comfort for rescue workers who were called upon to caringly sift through the rubble and take out the human remains from their forbidding tombs to transport them back to family for proper burial. Workers hauling records stopped. They prayed and put their names on that cross. On October the 3rd, 2001, the cross was removed from the shattered shell of Building 6 and placed on a 40-foot pedestal to be easily seen by all. And today, that cross stands as a permanent home at the National September 11th Memorial and Museum. Now, that cross that was found in the rubble of the Twin Towers brought comfort and it brought hope to first responders and to rescue workers and to family, all who came together to give aid on that day. But I'm reminded of something as I read the Bible. I'm reminded this morning of another cross. A cross and the most impactful event in all of human history that brings comfort and hope to us, to us each day. But not only for the day, but it's something that provides for us an eternity with Almighty God. Because God's only begotten Son died on that cross. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. The preaching of the cross, it's a strange message, is it not? I mean, think about it. That, that there should be life out of death. It's a strange message, but it's a shocking message. 
When we consider the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross, it was one of absolute horror. It was one of absolute torture. Back in the day, people would hardly talk or speak about the acts of a crucifixion. It was so awful. You and I can't even begin to imagine. Words can't put into, we can't put words into this. We can't even imagine the shame. We can't even imagine the pain or the, the agony that our Lord suffered and endured for our sakes. We don't have time to get in all the Bible verses, but you know the scripture reminds us that he was scourged, he was beaten, he was spit upon, his beard was plucked from his face, he was mocked, he was stripped, he was nailed. While the then world and the system of the world stood and jeered. Preachers of the preaching of the cross, it's a strange message. It's a shocking message. But, but you know what else we draw from that? It's also a very simple message, isn't it? The Bible is clear when it tells us that the way to be saved is to accept by faith what the Bible teaches about Jesus and his atoning death on the cross. You remember what the Apostle Paul wrote? In the book of Romans, Paul writes to the church at Rome, those believers in Rome, and, and he writes in Romans chapter 10, and he says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You say, that's it? That's it. It's to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, for your sin. This is what the message of the cross is all about. This is the word on the street. It's not about us quitting our sins. Well, what do I have to give up? What do I have to do? You don't give up. You don't do. Because the Bible says that Jesus Christ gave his life. God provided him for us as a gift. A gift is freely received. You didn't pay for it. I didn't pay for it. God paid for our sin. Your sin. My sin. Through the death on the cross of his only begotten son. It's about us coming to Jesus by faith. It's not about turning over a new leaf. It's, it's about us placing our faith in Jesus Christ. Him alone for salvation. And then living the new life that he's called us to. Amen. And sometimes folks I think that's mission. That's missing in the equation. We're in a bad way today in this country. With all the division and the, the infighting and, and, and the, the protesting and the burning and the, and the destroying and the hating and all of that. When it need not be that way. We trust Jesus for salvation. But you know what? Part of that, trusting him as salvation, brings us into relationship with him. And when we're in relationship with him, it's all about living the new life that he's called us to. Not saved, continuing trying to live the old life. If you're continuing to live the old life, you profess to be saved, but you're living the old life, newsflash. I don't believe you're saved. Amen. You say, well, that sounds awfully judgmental. No, you read the Bible. 2 Corinthians 5, you read the Bible. And see if you don't draw the same conclusion. There is the purpose of the cross. But what is the purpose? It makes a statement. Here's the purpose of the cross. If anybody ever says to you, what is the purpose of the cross? Here it is. It makes a statement. God loves you and me. Deep in it. That's the purpose of the cross. God loves you and me. In other words, folks, listen. You are loved. You are loved by God with an everlasting love. You know, the same way we have, an under, uh, we have a difficult time understanding the persecution and, and, and the trial and the, the crucifixion and the scourging and the mocking and all that that Christ took, the pain, the shame, the agony, the same way we wince, we, we cock our head, we have a hard time understanding that. I think equally so at times we have an understanding 
we have a difficult time coming to an understanding concerning the love of God because nobody has ever loved us that much. And we just can't seem to wrap our brain around that. Why would he love me that much? The cross is God's statement. It's his statement of love for the world. John 15, 13 says, Greater love is no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Uh, listen, this is what Jesus did. Jesus later said to the disciples, You're not just my servants, I call you friends. This message or the purpose of the cross provides salvation, as we say. Again, the Bible tells us that there's no other way to cleanse sin but through the sacrifice of an innocent one in the place of a guilty one. Listen, Romans 5.12. Jesus is the innocent one. Romans 5.12. You are the guilty one. Jesus had to die for your sin. You say, preacher, you know, you kind of preach into the choir. I think I got this. No, not everybody has this. If believers had this, if we had, listen, I, I don't think we'd be in half the mess in this country that we are today if believers just stepped up and lived like believers. Amen. If we just shared the word without judgment, we don't have to beat people up with the Bible. The Bible, the Bible's a big boy. The Bible can handle itself. We just need to live it. We just need to share it. Let the Holy Spirit of God do the heavy lifting. That's his job. He's the convictor. He's the guide. It gives life purpose, doesn't it? The purpose of the cross. Our lives would be lived for the glory of God. Remember Philippians 1, 6, being confident, being confident, Paul writes, of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you, will continue to perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And we're to live that life for who? For us? No. For him? Yes. To the glory of God. So unbeknownst to many, that cross found at ground zero shines as a beacon of God's love because it was on the cross where the Lord Jesus Christ embraced our pain and suffering, paid the debt for our sin, provided salvation to whoever will call upon him. And the light from the cross brings comfort. It brings comfort in tribulation, in hope and despair, life in the midst of turmoil and death. Preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying that Jesus is the hope for America. So let me end with this. And I don't want you to think that I'm going off the rails. Somebody say, oh, I knew. I knew he was going to come to this. Before I left on my trip. Someone asked me recently, knowing that we have an election coming up. Somebody asked me recently my view on the upcoming election. And they said to me, as best as I can remember it, they said, Preacher, neither candidate is my favorite in this election. I take my voting responsibility seriously, they said. As I remember, I'm trying to sort through the issues, but I also know that as a Christ follower, I'm a citizen of another kingdom, the kingdom of God. And my allegiance is to a higher supernatural power. And then they gave me two words. What were they? Guidance, please. Oh, boy. So I simply said this. And I'm letting you in on our conversation. If heaven and earth shall one day pass away, but his word shall not pass away, as Jesus stated, we do not take the Bible and try to make it fit the culture. Amen. Now hear me. We take the culture and bring it to the Bible. The thus says the Lord. 
I don't know if you agree with me, but I'll say it anyway. Cultures and people change. I tried to document that out this morning since the time of our founding fathers and the things that they wrote, the things that they say, the things that they believed in, the things that they did, as opposed to what goes on in a lot of our world today. So while cultures and people change, let me throw this out to you, the word of God is always and forever constant and unchanging. So with all that being said, how should a Christ follower vote? Two words. You ready? And they're not the names of the candidates. Two words. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. You vote whoever God lays on your heart. But two words. How should a Christ follower vote? Biblical values. Two words. Biblical values. With every election, we are voting for the soul of this nation. I want you to think about it. And I'm not just talking presidential election. Every single election that you have the privilege as a citizen of this country to vote in, you must, as a Christ follower, begin with biblical values. All right? What are you saying? It's not about the man, nor is it about the woman. It's about a platform of values and direction that will ultimately shape the nation, shape the family, and shape the home. And I've had more people say, like this person I talk with, I'm not a fan of either candidate. Fine. But if you're going to take your responsibilities as they related to me that they were going to, then how do you do it when you're not in favor of it? Listen, I'll be honest. The only, the, listen, the, the candidate I would be jumping up and down for and voting for every day and twice on Sunday is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But he's not running. But the biblical values, we look to those. And, and folks, here it is. And let me close. We will either seek to follow after God's own heart through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, or we will not. That's as simple as you can put it. There's platform for the candidates. So you look and you say, which candidate better follows the biblical values that we see given to us via the word of God? And that is the candidate, can't speak for you, but that is the candidate as a Christ follower. That's how we base our voting as a Christ follower. Biblical values. You are not just whatever your employment is, a construction worker. You're not a construction worker that happens to be a Christian. You are a Christian who happens to be a construction worker. Amen. All right? Amen. You're not a teacher who happens to be a Christian, you're a Christian who happens to be a teacher. You follow that? Because when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, old thing passed away, behold, all things become new, even your value system. You move from a worldly viewpoint to a biblical viewpoint. And if you're going to be in the biblical viewpoint, then even when it comes to an election, you look and you say, okay, what do I know about these candidates? What is the platform? Which one is closest to espousing the biblical values that I believe in, that I find in the word of God? Now, I could share with you platform. I'm not going to do that. This is up to you. But what I will say to you is if you have yet to vote, a lot of people have already voted. And I pray if you did that you voted biblical values. But if you haven't voted, would you keep biblical values in mind? And God help us as we pray, as you pray, as we cast our vote. Make it a vote that pleases God and that honors his word. Do not vote against the values of the Bible. When you vote against the values of the Bible, 
you are voting against what would please God in his word. Amen. Make sense? Yeah. yeah, boy, it does to me. And, and you know what? I became a Christian at 16. I first started voting at 18. And since I've been voting at 18 years of age, I'm 61 years of age now. That's 43 years of opportunity to vote. I've always voted from the time I came to Christ, biblical values. Biblical values. And I pray that you'd consider that as well. So, let's close in prayer together. Our time is gone. And what I'd like to do as we close in prayer, take a moment, and we're just going to have prayer concerning the upcoming election, concerning God's working in your life, my life, and in the life of this nation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we come before you now as believers in the Lord Jesus. And we thank you for your word, first and foremost. We thank you for that word that we were introduced to upon our receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. I thank you for the opportunity to read it, and to grow in it, and to learn more about it each and every day. Father, I pray this morning that if there be one here who has yet to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, God, that they would consider him the fact that he died on the cross for their sin, but not only died for their sin, but was buried and rose again the third day, just as he said. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let them come today, I pray. See me, see another one of our men, see one of our ladies. But oh God, save them, let them see their need. And God, as we mentioned, we are in this election year this year, and we are all, as a nation, voting for a president for our land. God, I pray that you would help us to look to you with our prayer, collective prayer as a church family, individual prayer as believers. We pray that your perfect will be done for this nation, that we be a nation that looks to you, that we'd be a nation that follows after you and your word. And Father, in spite of the candidates who may be running, whether people like them or not, the bigger question for the Christ follower is biblical values. For it's these values that have the opportunity to shape us and to make us as a nation. So God, I pray for wisdom for each of us. For those who've already voted, praise the Lord, they voted. And for those who have yet to, Lord, I pray they do. I pray we go into that voting booth with you in the forefront and our relationship with you solid. So bless us this day. Work in our lives. Work in our nation. And God, I pray that your work throughout the world would be one of saving souls until you come. Bless us. Give us safety as we travel to our homes, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, we pray this with thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you, and have a wonderful week in the Lord.